Ready? You want to roll? You all ready? Good. Amen. You guys are the best, man. The group is hungry, huh? So I don't have to worry about you falling asleep because you just ate, because I'm not going to let you fall asleep. <laughs> and if I see you, I'm just going to call you out and believe God for your name. And hey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So the dear sister came out and said, please, come on back to the bathroom. There's an opening. They were letting them. There's a big line for the bathroom. I said, well, I guess I'll do that supernatural thing I talked about. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. So don't think about it. Don't get distracted while I'm preaching. But no, I'm good. You all good? You have a good lunch? Man, I had fun getting to meet some folks and fellowship, some good, healthy questions in our group. Just love. I love questions. Questions are fun. Be careful, like, it, questions are good, just be careful where they're coming from. Don't ask them in a contentious way or a testy way. If you ask questions to God, ask in a very humble way, you'd be amazed how he'll give you understanding. Yeah. I mean, this, this book is not afraid of your questions. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but where you a ask your question from mm -hmm. determines how you'll hear the answer. Wow. Yeah. Come on. Are you following me? I've seen people ask questions and they, it, it's more of a statement or they already have an answer in their question. And Man, ask and it shall be given. So keep your heart humble in everything, okay? I'm telling you, the, 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 the attitudes that we've gotten familiar with that we think are normal, that don't produce life are the ones that we ought to challenge. Amen. Them attitudes that are detrimental to productivity and to life. You follow me? Yes. And... Uh, I'm telling you, it's such a trap because we've had them our whole lives and we, we tend to think they're normal. Like, like, I've heard people say, well, God made us this way. No, we became this way when man ate the tree and got cut off from who God was. When Jesus asks you to give your life, what he's asking you to give is what you never were in the first place. So people say... Christianity will cost you everything. Are you kidding me? It just costs you what you never were anyway. Wow, come on. Why is that a big price to pay? <laughs> to give up my old life is a big sacrifice? To give up my own rights and my own ability to reason? There's seminaries out there, lots of seminaries that teach don't let anybody infringe on your right to rationale and reason. It's a gift from God. You got to be careful with that teaching because the rationale you relate to isn't what you were made to have. God never gave you the gift of talking yourself out of Him. The reasoning man knows is what we were born into after they submitted to another voice. That voice, we became subservient to that voice. That analytical voice that says, did God really say? Well, God just knows it implies to know God. The voice implies to know God, right? Did God really say, you know, you should eat the tree? Well, yeah, God said, look, God just knows the day you eat the tree, your eyes will be open. You'll know the knowledge you're going to You'll be just like him. So that's a, such a seductive, analytical, and the more you listen and rationalize and reason, all of a sudden your gift of reasoning gets perverted and boom, she eats the tree. Adam follows her instead of God. That was his charge. You heeded the voice of your wife instead of me. Isn't that something? And then we're going to sit back and say, like emotions. Well, God gave us emotions, not the ones you grew up with. Let's just set that straight. Come on, if old things pass away and behold, all things become new, I bet he's talking about all things. The emotions you grew up with isn't what God made you to have from the beginning. The emotions you grew up with were self-centered, fear-driven, anxiety, self-conscious, self-centered. It all had to do with that love for yourself. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Those emotions aren't what Adam had before sin. They came through sin. It's called a fallen man. There's two places in the New Testament that talk about the salvation of your soul. Well, your spirit's already saved. You're born again. you got life inside of you. What was dead is now alive. Amen. What was tear is now wheat. Amen. You're one of those keeper fish. When the nets are drawn, you're, in the, you're going in the live well. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? You're a keeper. You, you're measured up. You're legal. You're, you're, you're a keeper. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But you've got to understand... 
that there's a salvation of your soul. That means a redemption of your mind, your emotions, the way you respond to things. And both places in the Bible, you can check it out. I'm not going to take a lot of time here right now. Hebrews 10 and 1 Peter 1, verse 9 is when it makes the statement. But 6 through 9 will give you the whole story. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. It's an amazing section of Scripture. But it talks about faith and walking in faith and not drawing back in Hebrews 10. Because if you draw back to where you were, it's certain destruction. It says, and, and God takes no pleasure in you, that doesn't mean he's displeased with you. It means he can't fulfill his desire and delight in you because you're not agreeing with truth. We always think he's mad at us. He says his soul takes no pleasure in you. It doesn't mean he's displeased. It means he can't be fulfilled in his heart. It's like a parent watching a child walk in something they're gifted in and succeed in something they step out in. And there's a joy in, in you watching someone walk out a destiny. Isn't there a pleasure in that? So if you're not walking in that, you can't take pleasure in that fulfillment because it's not there. So God takes no pleasure in that when you draw back because he can't receive the joy of watching you walk in what you're destined to. He loves you, remember that. He loves you. He's not controlling you. He's not like, can't believe you did that. Can't believe you're letting me down. That's how we treated one another. So somehow we think that's God. No, that was just man and his failed expectations pushed on each other. Come on, we have disappointed each other. And people have left us know it. God's answer is sending his son to die for you. That's his answer. His answer is giving you mercy in a way of escape and showing you a future when you didn't even think you had one. Come on, that's God's answer. Don't tell me he's displeased with you. It's not scriptural. He loves you. He can't take pleasure in you when you're not walking in faith because you won't walk out what you're anointed for. So you're not going to draw back. It's certain destruction, but we are those who move forward, it says, believing to the saving of the soul. Isn't that amazing? The soul, it's the mind and the emotions. Be real with me. Isn't the emotional life that we all grew up with, isn't that been our biggest detriment? Just living by how we feel? You know what one of the biggest traps is in the church right now? It's just living by how we feel. People with good intent just ministering to everyone's feelings. We spend countless hours ministering to each other's central lives. We actually believe if you're not feeling good, you're not doing good. Come on. What a lie from hell. Come on. Come on. No, if you're not believing good, you're not doing good. And sometimes you need to let them feelings line up to believe. And when those feelings are counterproductive, you need to just uphold your belief and stand in that place until things all around you just start agreeing. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. We've spent countless hours ministering to one another's feelings, impressions, memories, flashbacks, and none of them have anything to do with truth. You wouldn't even care about what you're remembering if your heart wasn't pure. Just because you remember a bad thing doesn't mean there's bad in you. It's a flashback. It's a familiar spirit. It's a blast from the past. It's a lie. And if you take it personal and internalize it, that's its goal. Come on. Its goal is to get you to believe you're still that when you don't want that. Yes. And then you're repenting for something you're not. Come on. Come and then you're giving out your identity and asking for prayer for something that's not even in your heart. It was just Come in your on. memory. Wow. But we say, well, you must need healing. You must need this. You must need that. If you're thinking that, it could be a devil. Amen. Come on, you're driving down the road and you remember the thing you wish you could forget. You haven't thought about it for a year and all of a sudden it's right there in detail. And if you're not careful and don't understand what I'm saying, you'll gray out, you'll take it personal, think something's evil in you, wrong with you, think you're backsliding and you'll call somebody for prayer. <laughs> Instead of rejoicing while you're driving in the midst of that picture and going, Father, I thank you. You've changed my life forever. Yeah. 
I thank you I'm not the person I used to be. I thank you you have washed me clean and made me pure and made me holy. And all of a sudden, you're submitting to God, resisting the devil. He'll flee. It's a one-step program. Come on. You're not taking some hit on your identity when that stuff isn't even in your heart. Amen. You say, well, how is it in my heart? I'm thinking it. If you were feeling bad about it, you ain't conjuring it up. Amen. <laughs> if you'd rather not see it, you're not producing it. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we think everything we think, feel, and imagine is who we are? That it's coming from some deep inner place. Come on, it's a lie. And the church, in a well-intended way, has bit that lie, and we're feeding that thing. It's like a monster. And all of a sudden, we're only as good as we're feeling, only as good as we're thinking and remembering. Look, if I got a lie working through my head, I don't have a problem as long as I have an answer. I'm not a man with a problem. I'm a man with a covenant. So you can whisper, a devil can sit on my shoulder every day and tell me I'm not worthy. He's just going to provoke me to worthy. <laughs> we think that voice has to go away. Oh, you let it spring you to a greater revelation, more intimacy, and a worship like life you never had before. Come on. Come on. That sure beats just graying out and calling for prayer, taking responsibility for everything that's running through your mind. I've watched good people take heavy hits because of this topic. And they're like, they're running well, they're doing fine, they're shining like a little light. Next thing you know, they're grayed out and sad, and you're like, what's wrong? Well, I, I just think there's something wrong with me. I think I need delivered. What do you mean? Well, I've been just remembering all that stuff, and out on the streets, and all that. Well, you're really sad about that. It doesn't look like you want to remember that. No, I don't know why I can't. I just feel, I feel so dirty. I feel like, why have I got this stuff in my heart? Honey, it's not in your heart. It's just passed through your mind. You ought to rejoice and thank God you're a brand new creation and you'll never be the same. That those days are over and gone forever. And let what the enemy's trying to do to crush you actually work a stronghold of truth in your life. Yes, yes. So if he's going to come and poke you, know Jesus more. Amen. Make him pay for that, man. Every time he pokes you, rah, poke you, rah. <laughs> Not, can you pray for me? <laughs> Some of these things aren't prayer issues. Amen. They're truth issues. The truth, it doesn't say prayer will make you free. It says truth will. If we're not careful, we become a ministry crazed people and we're always looking for somebody to pray for us and trying to contact God through praying for each other. You wake up in the morning and just say, it's going to be one of them days. I'm going to call so-and-so for prayer. No, lift your hands and worship Jesus and get a good perspective on the day. And let truth come into you and let Holy Ghost ah, and go for it. Why you got to call for prayer? Commune with God. It's the biggest thing lacking in our lives is communion with the Lord, getting to know Him. I just told some young ladies at lunch, nothing compares to your ability to be with Him. There's nothing greater on the planet than your God-given ability to be with Him. So why don't we be with him? Because things try to say we're not worthy. Something's blocking me. When I get alone, it doesn't feel real. And the list goes on and on of things that people say for not being with the Lord. And all of them are stemmed to self-consciousness and feelings. But let me tell you the truth. He shed his blood for you and his blood's speaking on the mercy seat on your behalf. You have access into this grace in which we stand because you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably ought to step on in and come boldly into the throne room of grace seeing you have a high priest who's passed through the heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Hebrews 4, Romans 5, it's all there. These are all scriptures I'm quoting. Come on. So you have no reason other than not believing the truth for not being with him. You say, yeah, but I failed. Yeah, but you care. Why are you letting your failure keep you from His grace? And see, I'm not preaching a grace that lets you stay the same. I'm preaching a grace that invites you in so you can be changed. Why would you keep back from one that loves you? He's actually the only one that's ever loved us this truly. And He's the one we'll come up with a reason to avoid. 
And he has asked you to boldly come in and receive mercy and help in every time of need. When don't you need mercy and grace? When? So just stay there in his presence. Are you guys all right with this? Listen, this stuff is huge to me. I said to Darren, you know, we could have talked about power and love stuff, going out and praying for the sick, and it's good if some of you did. My goal in the first session, I even thought about that, and I didn't feel like I had anything to teach you on that because... Man, I want the church, I want us to have such a foundation of truth that our identity is so set in Christ that everything we do in Him flows out of who He is in us. That it's, we're never getting our identity through being used by God. We're not, getting our, we're not feeling more Christian because we prayed for somebody. No, we prayed for somebody because we're in Him. We reached out because He's in us. We're not finding our identity through the way He uses us. We're finding our identity through who He is in us. It's the most healthy wellspring you'll ever walk in. Amen? There's people that are doing ministry to feel better about themselves. There's people that are trying to build kingdoms and build things to affirm themselves. There's people going the extra mile to build their own dreams and fulfill their own stuff because they're drawing something from it. And if it doesn't happen, they crash and burn and don't even have a relationship with Jesus. That tells you right out of the gate, it wasn't a good place. When has our relationship with him ever been contingent on how things are going? Come on. That's a fickle relationship. That's what we've had in our lives. Why do we make that Jesus? Come on. We say, well, I've just not been close to the Lord lately. There's a lot been going on. That's the reason to be so close. Well, I've made a few mistakes. Well, why is staying away from him going to help that? Yeah, I'm not being facetious. That, that, that is not, that is detrimental to what your heart's crying out for. Come on, your heart wouldn't even be crying out if you didn't care. You wouldn't even feel that way if you weren't alive inside. There's a lot of people, I just sat and talked to a bunch of folks at the table about this because this stuff hinders us. Why do you talk about that on the day when we're talking about healing? It has everything to do with healing. The salvation of your soul is a big deal. It's you getting so free from yourself that you're free from everyone and everything and you're secure in Christ. So even when trauma happens and tragedies come and things, you don't have to stop, look and listen and apply teachings you heard on the topic. You've become one with Him. You're not moved or shaken by stuff. You respond and live in the Spirit all the time in things. There's no fork in the road. You don't have to stop, look, listen. That's crossroads Christianity. No, you don't see a crossroad. You see the way. It's not about you. It's about Christ in you and through you. You get so established in that through relationship and through knowing him, it'll change your whole life. You'll pray for the sick from a different place. You'll believe for your own body from a different place. You'll never just make healing a doctrine. Healing's a covenant blessing and expression of God's love. He he heals because he loves you. Amen. You say, does that mean if I didn't get healed, I'm not loved? No, no, no. We're stepping into that thing. See, those kind of questions and that kind of mindset is what stops the release of everything accomplished. Good. Yes. The fact that we look with our eyes and think with our mind is detrimental to the release of God's kingdom. Right. We turn faith into a point in time and we pray and if nothing happens in the moment, we say, well, I don't know why God didn't heal. And we turn healing into a point in time and if it doesn't come, we stop it. I have always taught and we've always taught our folks back home to never learn, to never let go. Amen. Never let go. I don't care if the people you're praying for let go. You're the believer that brings the kingdom. The sign follows the believer. You're the majority in this situation, man. One in Christ is a majority. Learn how to never let go. We've had people say, well, I don't believe in healing. It's all right, just give me your hand. The church has taught that if they say that, they can't be healed. My Bible doesn't teach that. No. My Bible says, if I believe, I'll lay my hands on the sick and they'll recover. It doesn't say unless, of course, they don't agree with you. 
I've been in hospital rooms where people say, well, I just want to go be with the Lord. The only reason they want to die, and you say, well, God won't go against the will. That's not even their will. It's deceit. The only reason they want to die is because they can't relate to being whole because they've been sick so long and it's been so bad. And it'd be easier to die. Sometimes death is an escape and an answer. But if they would get up and be whole, don't tell me it wouldn't be a cool thing. They say, I'm just ready to go. You're ready to go because you're only relating to sickness. And then we buy right into that and don't have faith and say, well, they can't be healed because they don't want to be. They're ready to go. I can tell you so many stories. I see people say they're ready to go, and I'm like, I don't know if that's your call. Amen. This is not your life. Amen. You gave it to Jesus. Where do you get the right to make that call? Amen. I have one lady say, I walked in a room, she was ready to die. All her kids got born again. She just saw her last son pray a prayer, and she was dying. Her heart was bleeding blood, and I walked in the room, and she knows me. She knows me. And I walked in the room, and she said, her eyes got big, because she's waiting. She's waiting to die. She's ready. All my kids got saved. My dreams fulfilled. Listen, you be careful with that. Where does it say that your destiny is for all your kids to get healed and then you go? I wonder if somebody else's are saved. I wonder if somebody else's kid needs saved through you. Yes. When's it just about your little home? All right. yeah, yeah. Whose kids are worth less to God than your kids? Oh, yeah. Why do we covet what we call our own? Uh, There's no child on the earth that's worth less or more than my children. Every one of them is worth the blood. Yes, come on. Of course they're my flesh and blood. Of course they're my kids. Of course they have an inheritance and I have a stewardship of fathering. But when I start valuing my kids above your kids, I'm in idolatry. It's not preached much, but you think about what I'm saying. It's true. It really is true. Look, there was a time when I wasn't able to really hug my kids because of certain situations and what they were going through and the decisions they were making. But I could hug everybody else's kids. I wasn't sad. I wasn't thinking, well, if I can't hug mine, I ain't hugging nobody else's. You know, my mother died of sickness. It ain't like, well, I ain't praying for nobody else's mom. My mom died. She didn't get healed. I don't want to pray for nobody else. No, that's why I will pray for your mom. Because I know there's a higher truth than what we experience, so let's go for it and believe for your mama. See? But if you take life personal, you ain't ready for that stuff. If you just get analytical and you just process and you start covering the value of your mother above the gospel and above who God is, you're going to make a big mistake. You're just going to covet your own God-given life instead of Him. And all of a sudden you'll realize that, wow, God gave me a family at the expense of who he is because of how I'm thinking rather than in light of who he is. God never gave you children at the cost of who he is. He didn't give you children to run the risk every day of you changing your mind about him because of your kids. He gave you children so that in the light of who he is, you would steward him to them all the days of their life and express the character of God to your household. Amen. That way you're not even preaching at them. You're living him. And now they have something to honor and hear by called your life. We just talked about it at lunch. Man, if you're not living Christ-like in your home and you're just taking your children to church without realizing you're teaching them religion. You're teaching them that church attendance is Christianity, not Christ-likeness. And that everybody has their moments, and this is the way it is in everybody's home. And I know we sing all this stuff, but face reality, we all have our weaknesses. And all of a sudden, to them, it's hypocrisy, and why bother? And they lose their desire to go to church because it ain't real. That's good. (laughs) No, you want them to look at your life and know it's real. See, my son, I talked at lunch about all this, so it's all in my heart, but... It's not a distraction. It fits, believe me. My son, when he was a teenager, was believing one lie. He was believing that... You say, what's this have to do with healing? Everything. Because when your son makes a bad decision, how do you respond? Do you take it personal? Do you lose your identity and productivity? Do you fall apart? Do you blame yourself? Do you get condemned for his choices? Or do you stand in faith and keep shining as the light you've become? And you never change your mind about your kids or the gospel. Because that would be Jesus. Jesus never let what happened to him decide who he was. 
He let who he was in the Father decide his responses all the time. Amen. He never let sin against him produce sin in him. He overcame evil with good. Amen. You guys with me? Yes. My son, when he was a teenager, he was believing that he didn't want to be in our house because he had to do Jesus. <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, great. He's getting pressure from his friends. Why do you go to church all the time? Oh, your dad's a pastor. Ooh, better watch what we say around you. And then they'd all antagonize him, try to get him cross lines, and he'd do stuff, and then they'd be like, and you're a pastor's son. And they were just merciless in that arena. And he left it just eat him up. And he just started dreading the fact that he was my boy. He started dreading the fact that I was his dad. He started resenting the fact that he was in our house because he felt like he was compelled to do Jesus and, and that he was no other choice than to follow the footsteps of his dad. And it put anger and rebellion in his heart. And I'd sit and talk to him about it and say, buddy, that's a lie. You get to do Jesus. You're privileged to know him like any other person. You're not in a glass house. Our lives are always before him. And they're always before one another. Just because you're a pastor's kid doesn't mean you have a higher restraint on your life. Your conscience is before God. Do it justice and live right in His sight. Amen. Come on, I fathered my kids through it all. But it, you can't make them believe what you're saying. You can't go inside their heart and turn their will. That's right. Has God failed every time someone hasn't believed in Him? Has God failed every time somebody has died cursing Him? I promise you, you'll find that He wooed them to the end and gave them every opportunity and way of escape. That's what you'll find. Amen. His love had never failed. Yeah. So my son, he got caught up in drugs. He took off. He was a mess for a while in the natural. I mean, he just was out there, and it was terrible. He tells me what it was like, and he just cries. He said it was torment, and it was like he was out to prove something was being destroyed. He was destroying his life. But he felt like he couldn't come home. He felt like he hated me. I remember finding rap songs in his drawer. He was writing rap songs saying it'd be better if I was dead. He was wishing I would die so he could go and live his dreams and become the star he was supposed to be and all this and this famous rap singer. And, but he couldn't do it because I'm his dad. He couldn't pursue his dreams. I was the roadblock of his life. That's what the rap songs were saying. <laughs> that if I would just die, he could go do what he wanted to do. It's, that's not his heart. He's not just some evil boy. He was misguided in his beliefs. He was believing some things above truth. He was letting some voices from what he was calling friends matter more than what his conscience was telling him. It's not because he's evil and wicked. He's deceived and misguided. And the more that thing happens, the more it cycles, the more trauma you're in, the more torment you're in, the deeper you go, the harder it seems that you could ever get out. You just seem trapped. Sometimes you feel like you can't back down, you can't backtrack because it'll make you weak. And you, gotta, you started this thing, you got to step out in it, and you even know you're dying, but pride makes you stay there and get crushed all the more. Yeah. It's crazy how it works, man. I've seen it again and again in people's lives. Amen. So when he was 22, he knocked on the door one day, and I hadn't seen him for a long time, and he didn't want to even talk to me or see me. But he knew I was the only one home and he knew his mom was out of town in another state. And guess whose door he knocked on? The one he was right and he wished was dead. You know why he knocked on my door? Because he knows I'm for real. Because he doesn't have a beef with me. He knows I'm not a hypocrite. He knows I'm surrendering. He lived in the house with me for a long time. When he was seven... God busted the devil off of him one night in the middle of the night. He couldn't breathe. He was walking through the house and he was blue. And it was on a night when I preached on wavering faith and not letting anything change what you believe, even when it hits close to home. And I wasn't sacrificing my son to prove faith. I just wasn't afraid. I saw it for what it was. So I sat him on my lap on the steps and just rocked him and said, Father, I thank you. And he went, Daddy, I can breathe. I'm fine. I said, of course you are, buddy. I never talked to him about the devil. I never said nothing about an attack. I just took him to bed. And he's seven years old, just tucked him in. Merciless devil, man. Try to touch your little boy, because that's sure we get to the parent's heart, huh? So I go back to bed, and in the middle of the night, I sit up, and I knew something was wrong. My wife said, what? And I said, it's all right, honey. You just stay right here and just pray. It's all right. <laughs> you mamas are something else, man. <laughs> 
She honors me so much that the first time she was grabbing the phone, I'm not against 911. There wasn't no need for 911. I, I wasn't putting my son on the chopping block. I wasn't trying to prove faith. Something I saw. Please, the only thing you can do is hear what I'm saying and don't hear what I'm not saying. You say, yeah, but somebody did that and their son died. I'm not talking about that. I'm not trying to prove anything. I see. See, if I see it, you've got to leave me alone. Or you're going to say, well, brother, you've got to use wisdom. And I'm going to say, whose? That's it. That phrase alone has stopped the power of God more than we'll ever know. It was witchcraft. It was demonic. It was an assault on my boy. You've got to see that stuff sometimes. It wasn't a physical condition. It was a demonic spirit. I just held him and rocked him, and boom, he was free. I woke up in the middle of the night. He's, back. he's down staggering in the house. See, your boy doesn't forget this stuff. He's seven. Now he's 14 and all this pressure. Somehow it looks like he walked away, but if you train him in the way he should go, it ain't going away. When he grows old, he won't depart. When he sees a daddy that he has integrity toward and honor toward, he's coming there. When he's at rock bottom, he's coming there. We always call it the parable of the prodigal son or the story of the prodigal son. I think it's the story of his amazing loving father. I don't think the story has much to do with the son. I think it has to do with the place to turn. I think the story has much more to do with the heart of God than the waywardness of a son. We make so much out of the story about the boy because we all relate to the wayward side. The point of the story is you have somewhere to turn. And you think you don't deserve much and he's given you the kingdom. That story is about a great father. Amen. He's our father. Yes. And his spirit lives in us. Mm -hmm. So I can be the same father. Amen. Yeah? Amen. I think I'm gonna. Amen. He knocked on my door when nobody was home but me, trembling and shaking. He was 123 pounds. And he looked sick. I hadn't seen him for a long time. I peeked out the door and I said, Hey, buddy, it's so good to see you. That sure beats, where in the blank have you been? Well, you got your back so in the wall, now you're low enough to come here and knock and grovel and beg. What, do you have any idea what you did to the heart of your mother? What are you trying to prove? Sure beats all that. Oh, I'm preaching right now. <laughs> See, because you took their sin personal, because deep in your heart you feel like everybody owes you something. That's why you feel that way. Because they're your son and you feel like they owe you something. Now, I owe no man anything but to love. So, no matter how deep and dark you get twisted, I owe you to show you the Father's heart in the face of it all. You don't owe me a thing, so you can't break my heart. I didn't wake up for you to love me today. I woke up to love you in the Lord. That keeps things squeaky clean, buddy. You following me? So now I can love my boy on the porch. Yahoo! And I don't have to try to apply the sermons I heard on it. I've become it. In him, in relationship and prayer. So it's my only response. Hey, how are you? So it comes out real, not plastic. It's not projected. I'm not trying to pass as a Christian. It's all I see. And he breaks and cries and says, can I come in? I said, come on. He said, can I just sit down? I said, sit down. He goes to sit down. He's so shook up. He says, can I just hug you? Like he didn't even know what he was doing. Can I come in? Can I sit down? Can I hug you? I said, come here. And he, <gasps> he said, Dad, I don't even know where to start. And I just held him and I said, how about if I start? I said, I'm not disappointed with you, son. I said, I'm not angry with you. He said, I don't know how you can't be. Said, it's not even in my thinking. I said, if I cry at all, I cry because you're so much more than the decisions you're making. You don't owe me anything, son. I didn't, we didn't have you so you could live your life for us. Why would I be mad at you? I cry for you because you're so much more. 
He lost it. <laughs> he just lost it. My wife told me that he came to her over and over and said, I'm just overwhelmed by how dad received me. I know he preaches it all the time, but I was never in a position where I deserved so much and got nothing but love. I can't even comprehend how he responded to me at the door. Mom, it shook me to the core. Yes. It's supposed to. Amen. His love, his goodness is designed to lead you to change. It's not the reprimand of God that changes your life. It's the goodness of God. <laughs> yeah? See, you, you all are crying mess out there. They just crying everywhere. <laughs> I'm looking at tears all over. It's good. You had to pass the box like an offering plate. <laughs> Come on. Now listen. We know all the other opportunities we have to respond other ways. But Jesus is the way, not our way. And he's narrow and single. So there really is only one response, isn't there? Yes. And isn't it amazing how we have such a multiplicity of choices? I want to get narrowed down to him. I'm going to read to you what my boy just wrote in my Bible in February. He snuck it in there. I didn't even know he put it there. I went to preach and I opened up my Bible to preach and I thought, who wrote this big note in the front cover of my Bible? It's a big, long, it's a thing, man. And I was like, and I looked at the bottom and it said, your son Daniel. And I thought, wow, he wrote me a note. And then I had to sit down and check it out. And then it got me emotional. Can I read it to you? He mailed me a letter. He mailed me a letter after he came home. He put it in the mail with a stamp on it. And I opened it up and it was from him. He just talked about the season of rebellion and can't. Blame it on anything but his own wrong thinking and da-da-da. And, and he said, Dad, but I want to thank you. He said, I was there the whole time when Mom and Sis and me made decisions that weren't productive. And Dad, I want to tell you, you gave me the best gift a father could ever give his son. You gave me a life lived unchanged and unmoved in the face of all those things. Dad, I honor your integrity. You never change. You have continued to love Jesus and be like him. And it's the greatest gift you could have ever given me. Thank you. Amen. And it's, I stand in there just weeping. I'm going to pass that Kleenex box. I'm gonna read this. I love you, Dad. Thank you for surrendering your life to Jesus and becoming the man of God he destined you to be. Thank you for imparting so much truth in me since I was a young child, for never losing sight of me and my value, for fathering me and sticking by my side through thick and thin. Thank you for supporting me so strongly through this season of my life where I'm really learning who I really am. May the Lord continue to teach you and guide you in all divine wisdom and revelation as Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. I love you, Dad. Again, thank you. Your son, Dan. You good? You want those little notes. <laughs> that sure beats yelling and fussing and cursing and blame shifting and he said, she said it and rightness and wrongness and you started it and what do you expect? Well, why did you? I learned and I think you actually learned that nobody ever wins in that arena. It makes somebody right and somebody wrong, so we all lose. Yeah. Wow. Love is the perfection and the bond of peace. Amen. It's love where you find perfection yep. and the bond of peace. Amen. You guys with me? Yes. Okay. So let's wrap this thing up right here. Let's do this. This will be funny to you. You know where we were at the last break. Four, you remembered? Don't give up on me now. Come on. I was thinking we were right. We'll still find out. Okay. Do you know why I take so much time when we talk about healing to lay such a foundation? Because I want everything in our lives to flow from this healthy place. In my own personal life, 
I never pursued to be used by God. Never. I pursued to know Him. And God alone, when you weren't looking and desired His heart in me, His love in me, His ways in me. I sought Him for five weeks without fail in the beginning, right out of the gate. I'd turn my clocks to the wall because I was in that season where I could. My wife and I weren't together. I had all that time. I turned my clocks to the wall because I knew that if I saw the time, I'd probably pull out and think I needed to do this or that. I, for five weeks, literally only came out of my bedroom to, long enough to get cleaned up and go to work and come back. And I worked four 10-hour days, so I read my Bible morning, break, lunch, break, night. Five times a day, no less. Amen. And prayed morning, all day at work, night before bed. It was a great season. Yeah. It was a time where I had to give myself to Him to get to know Him. So for five weeks, I went into a bedroom and shut a door and turned the clocks to the wall and just sat there with him. It was amazing how he met me there. Please don't listen to a fellow like me and then go out and try to live what I'm preaching. Take what I'm preaching and get alone with him and say yes to it all. Say, I'm ready for your heart. I'm ready. I'm saying yes to love. Holy Spirit, you're changing me. You're putting the desire in me. You're swallowing up weaknesses. I don't have to bite my lip and live with this man's preaching. I'm becoming it in your presence. And you're making me your workmanship. Thanks for unveiling this trophy and going, ta-da, and letting my light shine to the world. Come on. You ought to learn to pray like that. Gets my hair standing up. That's just so good. I, I'd walk my bedroom in them five weeks. Nobody taught me how to pray. I wasn't sitting under nobody. I just started going to a church down the street. I had no mentor, nothing. I'd just shut my door and be with him. I'd covet my Bible, man. I'd cleave to it and hold it. And I'd say, you're in this book. Who you are is in here. And I would, tears just poured in my face. I'd say, men are saying all kinds of things about you. There's so many different things out there but I want to know you for who you are and I want you to show me. And I just thank you for giving me understanding. And I begin to read and oh, it just started making sense. But what did I do? I positioned myself to be with him. And through being with him, he revealed himself to me. I had so many encounters with God, I don't even talk about them because people chase manifestations. I just sought to know him. Watch this. In nine months... I was guest speaking in churches. Guest speaking in churches, being invited to churches by the age of nine months old in the Lord. Had a home group and was the leader of the home group. Served in the altar ministry at four months old in the Lord of my church. And in six months old in the Lord, I was teaching a class on how to be transformed. You say, well, you were pretty young. You get puffed up. There was nothing puffed up about it. I would weep because of the honor of being like him. I would weep because his heart was in me. I would weep because I knew I wasn't a self-made man. I knew in that bedroom he changed me. And here's the cool thing. Everybody around me knew he changed me. That's why all those doors were opening up. Now watch. At the end of nine months, every gift listed in the nine spiritual gifts that flow through believers' lives, every single one flowed through my life at nine months old in the Lord by the time of nine months, and I wasn't even able to teach on it, probably didn't even know where it was in the Bible, because that wasn't my focus. Amen. Nobody taught me what a word of knowledge was. I just stood by a man that was 40 and said, you're facing an operation, and it's extreme, and if you don't have a miracle in your body soon, you're going under the knife, man. He said, in the morning, in the morning. How do you know? I said, I don't know, I just know. We need to pray. He cried and the hernia went closed under my hand. And God gave him a brand new abdominal wall and the doctors found no weakness, no seam, no tear and never put the mesh wires in his belly. I was four months saved. That's what we think. No, nope, I was with him. And I wasn't asking to be powdered and diapered and changed. I was thanking him who he was is inside of me. You should have heard me in those five weeks walk in my bedroom. Father, I thank you I'm born again. I thank you you've changed my life forever. My life, see, I wasn't afraid to pray this stuff. Somebody in the church might have tried to stop me and say, now, brother, yes. there wasn't nobody there to stop me. And, and look what happened to me. It's awesome. See, it's not my fault. Every promise is to the believer. What do you believe? 
What do you believe about his blood? What do you believe about his accomplishment? What do you believe about what it says about you personally? How do you believe he sees you right now? Who do you believe you are in his sight? That stuff's important. And if you're still attached to something you did, something you didn't do, something that was said by somebody else, and you're letting that trump what? Come on. See, what do you really believe? Because I just have to believe he loves me. <laughs> and ain't nothing nobody can do about it. So I'm in that bedroom with great confidence, not arrogance, boldness. Father, I thank you. I'll never be the same. My life has changed forever. God, I'm born again. And I would be yelling loud in my bedroom. Loud. Father, I'm changed forever. The days of stress and strife and anger and frustration are over for me. I call them dead and I put them aside. And I put on your image, your love, your nature. God, even me, my life, I see as a tree ripe for the picking. The fruit of your spirit hanging all over me. God, hungry men, pick of my life and get satisfied. You've changed me forever. I would shout like that and pray that way all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd say, I'm one of two things. I'm either out of my mind and need to get a life. Or he's in the room and I'm getting the life. It's one of two. I'm either he's not real and I'm wasting my time. Or he's there and I'm being changed. I'm going with the second one. All my chips are on freedom. I tell people I'm the, I'm the most deceived man you ever met. And I need serious ASAP ministry right now. Or I'm free. And I'm telling you, I'm putting all my chips on free. See, you don't live with me. You just see me on the weekend. I live with me. Amen. And you know what? I like me a lot. <laughs> that's a good statement because a lot of folks have learned not to like themselves. That's it. Absolutely. And that's a crisis because you love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you don't see yourself clear, how are you seeing them clear? The second commandment is like the first. They're tied together. Love God with all your soul, your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And love your neighbor. I wonder if you have a poor view of you. I wonder if you're nitpicky, self-condemned, fault-finding, critical. I bet that's the eye you'll see others with. And I bet you'll see what's wrong with them instead of their destiny. I bet you'll pick out their faults instead of their purpose. And I bet it'll make you feel like you're not the only egg in the basket. and It'll relieve you because we all have our stuff, you know. You love your neighbor as yourself. The clearer I see myself in him, the greater view I have of you. And all of a sudden, I understand who you really are. You getting this? You say, what's that have to do with healing? I think you see it has everything to do with healing. All of a sudden, the nature of God, the will of God, and the intent of God is so before me that it inspires everything that I'm doing. Where did all those gifts come from in nine months? Is it because men laid hands on me and imparted them to me? Or is it because I was with him? I'm not against impartation. Just don't let that doctrine take the place of being with him. Amen. It's, it's, it's running the risk. The, the doctrine of impartation is so preached anymore. And you young people, be careful because I watch it. It's running the risk of becoming idolatrous and taking the place of being with him. You don't just run. You're not going to run to me for me to lay hands on you and get what you see in me. Amen. What you see in me came from being with him. You're not going to get it apart from being with him. Why would you want to shortcut that beautiful thing? Amen. Why would you just want to step in the outcome of being with him? Go be with him. Amen. And get to know him so you become the best you, the most confident you. Let the impartation be from him. I understand impartation is scriptural. I'm not against it. Be careful it doesn't take the place of the way of intimacy and relationship. You guys good? Just be careful. I have people coming up to me over the years. It doesn't happen much anymore because I talk about it. And people listen to the YouTube stuff. <laughs> but before I talk about it, I used to go to a church and they'd all line up. Give it to me, man. Just lay it on me. I want what you got. I want it. Come on. I'm ready. Importation, brother. And I'm like, man, I ain't praying for you. Stop. <laughs> I'm like, what are you? 
What are you asking me to give you? What I see in you, man, I want it. I said, I can't give that to you. But I can point you to him. Now go be with him. I swear, that's how I would answer him. But I understand impartation. But listen, why did all of those gifts flow through my life by the age of nine months in the Lord? I'm talking workings of miracles, prophetic discernment, everything listed there. There wasn't one gift that I didn't experience in my life. I went to a ministry school to sit in on it one night. They were teaching on the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they read them off, and were teaching them, and I went, well, I've experienced every one. I was nine months saved. They gave the students assignments to go seek God for these things, desire these things, and then walk them out, and then write their experiences and do their little homework assignments. And I could have filled in the whole list, the whole paper. I could have finished the assignment just because of my nine months in the Lord. It was so refreshing because nobody taught me, and then I was trying to do it. I was with Him, and it was the automatic response of being with Him. Without all the, whoa, and the, wow, that was prophetic. Whoa, that was a, whoa, the discernment, dude. Whoa. I didn't know to go, whoa. It was just in my heart. It was just who he is. It was what he was doing. Yeah, I was excited about it. Yeah, I was like, wow, I knew that. God, that was you. But I was, I was even though I was young in the Lord, I knew it was him. It wasn't because I'm a super Christian. It's because he's good. And I realize that being with him is where it's at. Amen. So I have always taught strongly relationship with the Lord. Anything I've ever preached is rooted strongly in relationship. You listen to that Kingdom Living School out there. It's HCSKL 2011. It's 156 hours. It's like 10 weeks before we even talk about the supernatural. It's on purpose. I didn't design it that way. I didn't have a syllabus or a curriculum. I just stood up in class like this every day and got my Bible, and we just went for it. We talked about everything. Who's done that? Who's listened to that school? We covered fasting, intercession, water baptism, communion. Woo! Was it good? I'm telling you, some people got wrecked by the whole fasting thing. We did a whole session just on fasting. And, and works and fasting that's healthy. And God gave me wisdom while we were teaching and preached fasting like I had never preached fasting in that school. I talked about stuff like if you're, if, if you're fasting and you're like, oh, man, why do I got to be fasting today? Oh, and they're having this. Do you smell that? And I'm like, you're missing the whole point. Just go eat it. <laughs> you're not sacrificing and suffering yourself. You're suppressing the carnal nature. You're not sitting there going, Bummer, why am I fasting today? I didn't know that was on the menu. Come on, if that's your response, just go eat it. But we just talked about that and we explained that. And the fasting one, I got a lot of response from. The communion one really got response from. You know what the Lord told me? I believe it was the school where the motive, he said, teach on communion. He said, I want my people, I've given communion. It's, it's a gift. It's a contact point of faith. And it will inspire them to intimacy and activate their heart before me. Who's ever gotten a room and they feel like once they get there, they're not sure where to go from there and God doesn't feel real and what do I say now? And yeah. you tend to get self-conscious and sometimes you take 20 minutes to get past your own flaws and faults in confession before you feel like you can look up. And some of that's legit when your heart's really convicted of things that you didn't deal with. But a lot of times it's just self-centered deception and then it shuts you down from intimacy. But communion, it puts you in a position to remember him. Yeah. Oh, and all of a sudden you're starting to remember and you're starting to communicate your faith and your understanding and the Holy Spirit will let it grow. And you're reading scriptures about the bread and the body and you can go to a place where they're taking communion in the Bible or read a John 6 where he's talking about the blood and the body. And whew, It was a fun season in my life. I was so young in the Lord and I was doing it every day. And the gospel went boom. It got to a point where it was 45 minutes and I'm still holding the bread. I had to stop receiving communion and just live by remembrance because I had never made it to the office. It's 45 minutes and I'm still holding the bread going, oh, <laughs> quoting what the body accomplished. The body of Jesus accomplished a lot. Do you know what the standard is for revealing an antichrist spirit? 
is the denial that Jesus came in the flesh. Why is that the barometer? Because an antichrist spirit doesn't want you to know what he accomplished and the benefit of him giving his flesh. Doesn't want you to see the power of him coming as a man, sacrificing his body in innocence and taking the guilt of humanity away. So a spirit that's not of God, the way you discern it's not of God is because it doesn't accept and it denies that Jesus came in the flesh. Why? Because it's so important for you and me because he accomplished so much. Man, when I read a scripture like that, I'm searching out what his flesh did. That was your question, man. And I, I'm searching out what his body and why it's so important. So 45 minutes in, I'm still standing there going, oh, no. And now I got the cup of blood, the blood of the new covenant. And I'm already 45 minutes in in a mess. The next thing you know, it's an hour and a half, and I'm still holding the cup. <laughs> so I had to stop taking communion. <laughs> I just live communion. <laughs> I'd never make it to the office. But when I started, it wasn't like that. It just kept growing. It's called communion with the Lord. Communion. Co-union. Isn't that awesome? Come on. Don't say you don't have time. Don't, don't talk yourself out of it. You say, well, yeah, but my schedule, Dan. You can be with him in the car. You got to drive. Don't be ashamed. Be with him in the shower, naked and unashamed. You can sit on the potty and talk to the Lord. He ain't thrown by that. You know, you get out of the shower, excuse me, Lord. Are you kidding me? I'm not being weird. I'm just saying your, your conscience is clear before the Lord. I'm just saying you have more time than you realize. I realize some people have a crazy schedule at the moment and you wish it would change a little and you have a lot of responsibilities and stuff. But I'm telling you what, you women, you, 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 if you're the one that does the laundry and you still work and you're doing, and you say, well, yeah, Dan, you don't, I do work, I got to come home, laundry, then they expect supper. My life, it never ends. Well, good, it's never going to end. <laughs> so don't complain about that. You always see your life as a gift. And you never start dreading the things you're serving your loved ones in. That's right. Don't you start complaining because you're revealing to the enemy you're making it all about you. And I'm telling you, things will implode quickly. And you think somewhere between five loads of laundry and this and this, I've lost my joy, my intimacy with Jesus. No, it's the way you perceive it all. It. Watch this. You're throwing wash in the washer. And you just came from a long day of work. And you're thankful in all things. And now you're throwing wash in the washer and you pull out your husband's shirt, and all of a sudden you're just blessing and prophesying and praying over him. And you get little Billy's pants. Father, I just thank you. Little Billy is so called of the Lord. God, your grace is upon him. What a teachable, amazing young man. I am so honored that he's my son. God, I thank you for Billy. I thank you for revelation in his heart. And you're just praying and enjoying, and the wash is spurring you to intercession in a consciousness of your family. <laughs> whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Paul said, don't you complain. Don't you complain. Listen, we're not going to talk about healing and pray for the sick and seek healing and keep complaining in our mouths. Because when you complain, you reveal it's all about you. But you sing it's all about Him. It says when you complain, you're devoured and destroyed by the destroyer. It says you're just like them in the wilderness when you complain. And Paul says, I write these things for your admonition that you never follow their example. See, there's a trap to complaining. When you lose your thankfulness, you reveal that you're taking life personal and you've lost sight of truth. Yeah. I'm being straight. Come on, a friend will talk to you like this. Yeah. I'm not saying this to spank you. I'm saying this to help. I'm not saying this to show you where you're not, but to show you where you're called. Amen. He said, do all things, Philippians 2, do all things. How many things? All, all things without 
grumbling, murmuring, or complaining. Why in the world would I do that? So that you are seen as an innocent, harmless child in the midst of a perverse generation whom you shine forth as a light holding forth the word of life. Why don't you complain? So they see your faith. They see your doctrine. They see your relationship yes. through your life. Come on. When you complain, you're just like everybody else, only you go to church. That's it. Come, on. Come on, be real with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, that's good. You like that kind of preaching, don't you? I'm telling you, 17? Are you 17? When I was 17, I wish somebody talked to me like I talked to you all. I think, I think it would have helped me. Because nobody talked to me like this. I was 33 and Holy Ghost talked to me like this in my bedroom. And I went, whoa! He straightened me up quick. Told me who I was. He talks to me like this. That's why I talk to you like this. One time I was driving down the road thinking negative. That's very rare for me. I, I, I mean it. It's not a joke. I went almost a mile thinking negative. That is a strange day for me because he has conditioned me different. But I went a whole mile thinking negative about something I was believing for. I pulled up at a four-way stop sign. Holy Spirit said, boy, now would be a good time to practice all that stuff you preach. Threw me right out of that thing. I'm like, you are a best friend. <laughs> I didn't cry. I didn't like, oh, look. I was like, ha, oh, oh, ha, oh. ha. I was like fist bumping and high-fiving. <laughs> That's a good God right there, man. He just slipped up. Boy, now would be a good time to practice all that stuff you preach. <laughs> ah! Pulled me right out of that junk. <laughs> And then I start speaking life and prophesying. And well, <laughs> it just was good, man. So why wouldn't I be playing and talk to you straight? Come on, I always see this as a family in a living room, man. I don't see this as church and a service and preaching. I just, we're the family of God. We're the body of Christ. It's just a pep talk, man. It's like a pep rally. We're just staying fixed on truth and stirring one another in love and good works. Staying on course. Walking through. Amen? That's how I see it. Ephesians 4. It's the going joke, man. Last week I tried to read Colossians 3 the whole weekend and never made it. And then I went to another church on Sunday and went, whoa, I was saving Colossians 3 for you guys. And then I preached out of it and read it and it was awesome. But the whole weekend, I had us sitting on Colossians 3 and preached the whole gospel and never read Colossians 3. It was the going joke. But I'm going to read this. I want you to see this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about actually healing. And tonight, we're going to really nail that thing. We're going to pray and have a good time in the Lord, okay? And, uh, yeah. Okay. At some point, I'm going to open it up that like I did when I taught the kingdom school. Darren, you don't have no preference in this. You're going to let me flow with whatever I discern and feel, right? Okay, good. Uh, at some point, I'm going to open it up when I'm talking about healing. That while I'm talking, if you, if you have a couple questions, I'll, I'll take a few. But, but, but don't be quick to ask questions because you'll be amazed how much they get answered when I'm preaching. But if I'm preaching for a while and we've been going for a while and we're getting close to like praying and stuff and you still have a couple questions, I, I might open it up to just raise your hand politely and give me the grace to discern when I should take it and how long I should answer it. But so if I give you that grace, you got to give me grace as well. And we can do that thing orderly, okay? But I love questions. I really do. Like questions make such a draw on truth, it's ridiculous. Like I am not afraid of any question ever. I've never been afraid of a question. I found that this book has an answer for everything. Like everything. My, my notes in my Bible say that nobody should talk about Paul's thorn because it's impossible to know what it was. And I'm thinking that's just read your Bible. The Bible tells you what it was. You say, how do you know that? Did God promise Paul that he'd suffer persecution for his name? 
Did he? Yes. Is there promises for healing in your Bible? Yes, so if Paul was sick, God was asking him to remove something he promised he would, and God changed his mind and said, my grace is sufficient. If God, if you fathered your children like that after one time, two times, you'd teach your kids how to never take you at your word. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants us to not be able to take God at his word. Watch this. Paul was asking God to remove something that he promised he'd experience. And he said, look, I told you this was going to be this way. My grace is sufficient for you. Now get back in there and preach the gospel. If Paul was talking about sickness and it's what we preach, we'd never have a platform ever again to believe God for anything because it's all subject to his discernment, his decision, and his grace. And you'd never be able to say to the mountain, move and have it move because you'd never know if God wants it to move. You'd be indecisive and faith and belief means fully persuaded and convinced. The word believe means fully persuaded and convinced. How could you be fully persuaded and convinced if the will of God is in question? If Paul's asking God to move sickness, if you read before the, the chapter, perils, 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 perils. And I think one more perils. <laughs> and none of them are sickness. They're all persecution in the cost of the gospel. The word buffet means blows to the flesh. The word infirmity, he interchanges it, and the translation does a beautiful job, actually. He uses the word infirmity in two sentences in a row, and the one, it's interpreted weakness, and the other one, infirmity. It doesn't mean sickness. It means human weakness. When you're preaching the gospel, and every time you open your mouth, they club you, whip you, stone you, and beat you, that's intense. We clam up because people look at us funny. Yeah. Be real. They beat him for it. And he, they stoned him. He got up and went back in and kept preaching. Jesus came by his bed and said, I want you to hang here. I want you to stay here. I'll take care of you. I got a lot of things you need to say in this place. At the end of Acts, somewhere around 21, he said, all I know is this. Every city I go, everywhere I go, chains and prisons. Holy Ghost is telling me chains and persecutions are waiting for me there. But none of these things move me because I don't count my own life dear. So I might fulfill the will of him who called me. I think he got the point because there was a time back he said, God, I can't take anymore. Why can't I just preach the gospel? Why do I always have to get pummeled? Why does this thing buffet me and give me blow after blow? All I'm trying to do is save some souls. That's what you called me to. And God said, listen. Your weakness is perfected in my grace and my strength is perfected in you through that weakness. You keep trusting me because my grace will take you through what you're feeling. Here's how you know what it was. Because of the promises of the Lord. God gives promises for healing, promises for persecution. When you ask God to remove something He promised, He's, he's not entitled to. It's where His grace is enough. So if you have a son and you tell him to do this and walk this out, and if you do, I'll reward you with this. And at the end of that season, you say, listen, I'm sovereign. I'm the parent. You're the child. I've changed my mind. I don't expect you to understand, but you've got to trust me because I'm the dad and you're the son. One day, maybe you'll understand, but we're not going to do that. Yeah, but daddy, you said after six weeks, you would I understand what I said. But son, I'm your dad. Hush up and respect me. I made a different decision now. Yeah, but Dad, you said, I understand that, but I've changed my mind and it's in your best interest. We don't do this. You just need to understand. You do that one more time with your boy and you've just taught him now to never take you at your word and yet we preach that God's that way with Paul. Why? Because the enemy himself wants to accomplish that you can never take God at his word. Where do you find the will of God? The life of Jesus. When you see me, 
You have already seen the Father. It was written in the volume of the book to do your will, O God. We say so many things about healing that were never in Jesus' mouth in the whole Gospels. Amen. Jesus never did not heal somebody and say, it wasn't your time, you don't have faith, sorry, it's not the will of God to heal you, this is his sovereign choice, he's trying to teach you a few things, just bear with it. We say all that stuff. Jesus never said any of it. You know why we say it? It makes us feel better about what we're troubled over. It gives us an answer when we don't seem to have one. Trouble is it's at the cost of truth, and truth makes us free. He never prayed for somebody and they just sat there and stayed sick. And he said, you know, you need to get the unforgiveness out of your life. Let's go through a heart search and get yourself aligned so you can be healed. His goodness just ran it all over. Didn't it? You show me one time when Jesus didn't just run over everything in front of him. You say in his hometown he couldn't do any mighty miracle because of their unbelief. It's simple why he couldn't. It doesn't mean he touched a paralytic and he stayed paralyzed. Can you picture Jesus touching a paralytic and he stayed paralyzed? Who can picture that? Who can picture them walking a paralytic onto the streets of Nazareth and laying him down and going, hmm, well, go ahead then. If you're from above, we know you're David's boy or Joseph's boy and Mary's boy. We, we, we know, we watched you grow up. Where do you mean you came from above? So if you're all you say, you are healing. Could you imagine Jesus telling the man to get up and he just lays there crippled? Get up, sir. And he lays there crippled. Sir, get up. And all of a sudden he looks at the town and says, you know, he could be healed if you guys would get on the program with me and believe. Do you think that man is paying the price for their unbelief and that their unbelief is stopping the revelation in him? We teach it as if he touched a paralytic and they stayed paralyzed. No, what happened was they thought he was loco. There was no people to pray for because they didn't bring the sick on the streets like they did in all the other towns. They all says they all went to their homes. You know, here comes cuckoo. So he healed a few sick folks. He must have saw people, a few people lingering around and he healed them, but he did no mighty miracle because of their unbelief. Doesn't mean he couldn't operate. It doesn't mean he was rendered powerless. It doesn't mean that unbelief is greater than the power of God. <laughs> Who believed at Lazarus' tomb? Did Lazarus raise from the dead? Who believed when the man's arm was withered on the Sabbath day and they tested Jesus trying to get him to heal to accuse him before the crowd? That doesn't sound like faith or love. They exploit a man's sickness, said, tell us, teacher, is it lawful to <clears throat> heal on the Sabbath? Can you imagine the guy? They're exploiting him, using him as a guinea pig to set up Jesus to get him judged before the people. Jesus says, let me ask you a question. Who of you, having a sheep, falls in a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't get it out of a pit? Amen. And then he answers why he heals. He doesn't heal because there's faith in the room. There's already faith in him. He heals because of God's love for people. Because he says, how much more value well, is a man than a sheep? And he said, sir... In the face of unbelief, sir, stretch forth your hand. <laughs> Who in the room was believing? No one. You say, brother, you got to get the unbelief out of the room. Where did we get that? Man. The little girl dies. They hire mourners that play a tune, and they have professional wailers. Study culture. They're hired mourners. They would come and play a dirge, and the ladies would, woo, woo. And you'd be way down in the market, and you'd hear that sound and go, uh-oh, somebody died. And you'd follow the sound. you go, oh, my goodness, that's Freddie and Judy's home. Oh, my. And you find Freddie crying. Freddie, what happened? It's my daughter. Oh, no. Jesus comes in there. And they're all, wee, 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 woo, woo, resurrection and life. Amen. Come on. He's coming to get her up. Yeah. 
He says, why are you crying? Why are you, stop. She's not dead, she's sleeping. They reviled him, mocked him, and was like, yeah, right. And he put them all out. We turned that into, you got to get the unbelief out of the room. You know what you're teaching? You're teaching that Jesus said, little girl, arise. Little girl, arise. Little girl, arise. You, you, you and you, get out of the room. <laughs> Little girl, arise. Ah, that's weird. Amen. That's what we taught. Yeah. We've taught that in the church. That's the picture yeah. we get. Amen. That you've got to get the unbelief. So here's what happens. You walk in a hospital room and you perceive the fear. You hear the negativity. You see the tears of despair. And your faith is shaken to the core because you actually believe all those teachings without realizing it. And you think God can't move in the room, but yet you're a believer and one in Christ is a majority. I was in a hospital room and a man had no hope. And he was supposed to die. And the doctor just told the family, we cannot help him. I walked in as the doctor walked out. They're all crying. I said, hey guys. I just came to stand with so-and-so and pray. And they said, look, Dan, we just need to let go. He just, we've been praying, but he's going to... I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who will believe our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord extended? Come on, guys. You don't want to let go now because then you'll always be threatened with regret later. The devil will come to you and say, ah, if you'd have just held on and believed, who knows what might have happened? You gave up too soon. And you say you're in faith. And you say you love them. And you quit believing because of that report. The devil's merciless. Mm -hmm. He gets you to give up on faith. And then he comes back and, and gets on you for giving up. Right. Yeah. And then you can never hear the clear gospel again because you have to face that thing. So you condition yourself to hear a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, man. Mm -hmm. I said... Are you guys kidding me? Listen. And they're like, well, I was in one hospital room where they, they my, the family knows me, loves me, but they said, Dan, you, you just, you, you, you're too aggressive, you're too this, and they told me I needed to get out of the room. They're just going to stand and be with their loved one as they die. And I said, so you don't want me to pray? You don't want to agree with me and pray and believe? We're called to raise the dead. Why don't we just go after this and grow in this thing? So there's never a regret. And they went, Dan, when do you just let it go? Just let it go. And I'm like, you never let go. When do you let go? And they told me to get out of the room because they were just so emotionally, they just wanted it to end. That's a tough day for the family because later down the road, if they start considering the gospel, they can hardly hear it clear because they have to address that day. And then this condemnation comes on. I'm like, well, you didn't stand. You didn't believe. You followed what the doctor said. You gave up on hope. But I was in one where none of the family agreed. And I looked and I said... Listen, I said, I, I, you know, to agree touching anything, if, one, if somebody wants to agree with me, that's fine, but I don't judge you guys, but would you give me the honor of praying for him? And they were like, yeah, but they're all crying, and nobody felt like they had faith to stand with me, so I said, hey, that's fine. So I just went over and prayed for him. He never died, never had a surgery, and got totally, completely healed. Amen. I'm not saying that to boast in me. I'm saying that to say there's a place to never change your mind. No matter what. I've been in places where I had to bury people. I've been in places where kids practically died in my arms. But don't think I wasn't doing everything I knew to do and was trained to do by the Holy Spirit. I was trying my best in grace, in faith. And we lost them. I don't change the doctrine because the boy died. Amen. I grow in it all the more. I go after him more. I seek him more. Because I know like you know, if Jesus was holding him, He'd be healed across the board. I don't care what denomination you're in, you would answer that way. Yeah, if on. Jesus held the boy, it's a done deal. Amen. So where is Jesus? Amen. And who are we? Amen. His embodiment. Amen. And he said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe. So I guess our belief is on the chopping block. I guess if you were the enemy, that's what you would attack. You would get us to fight over our sentiments, our losses, and all that stuff. You'd get people to touch each other wrong and say, well, you didn't have no faith. Mm. And then people get offended. Don't tell me I didn't have it. Now we're all fighting, and we've made a perverse thing out of it. Mm. And now we got all these little camps and streams and things that God never built or dug. And a lot of it, a lot of it is self-preservation. 
And we're just trying to band-aid our pains. But they don't work, guys, because they rob you from true faith. And they make you powerless when you need the power of God. And then all you can do is submit to the sovereign doctrine of the Lord. And you won't do great exploits. Well, I'm on this thing. If you're listening to my heart, you're hearing what I'm saying because it's all attached to Scripture. I haven't seen enough in my life. There's too many things I haven't seen happen that, that I know can happen. You can hear my emotion in that. I cry inside, but he gives me a great grace to not cry in front of you. There, there's, there's too many things I haven't seen that I know can change. But watch this. I've seen way too much to change my mind. I haven't seen enough, but I've seen way too much. I've found that people that are fighting in their heart over this whole thing aren't experiencing anything and they're letting their lack of experience be their validation for their belief. People that are believing for nothing are getting nothing and they're going, see? I've seen too much. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen tumors disappear in front of me. I just watched a lady last week who couldn't walk from a stroke. She could have chased me around the church in front of everyone. Just last week. You can call them over there at Gateway in Indiana or whatever the church, something, gate something. I don't know. I was in a service. I see the lady. Has that a hard cast? Is that a hard cast? This boy had a hard cast. He's a guitar player, but he had a hard cast. He just broke his arm. We were in service in Florida and praying and preaching and praying. And I didn't know what was going on. And the pastor said, boy, I would have told him too. Whoa, what are you doing? He's all excited. He said, I'm healed. He said, what do you mean? He said, I felt God mend my bones when they prayed for me. He said, but you just broke your arm. He said, but God mended my bones. He said, I'm taking this thing off. He said, now you'll find out when they take it off, you'll be healed, you'll be fine. No, no, God mended my bones. They went somewhere. I'm not telling you to do this. This kid did this on his own. I had no idea he was doing it. I tried to talk him out of it just because of parents and stuff. <laughs> they found some cutter thing, and they put it on a video on the phone, and he said, I'm cutting this off because I felt God mend my bones. And and he put it on his Facebook with a testimony, and somebody was like, that dude got real faith, and people were commenting. And... Now, you know when you're wearing a hard cast, you got atrophy, you got to rehab a little, you got to exercise to get strength back. He cut this thing off and took it off his hand, had full use of his hand with no limitation, and jammed out in front of all of us with his guitar. I was in a service and a lady had 11 breaks in her leg and she had this apparatus on that had her up to here from the foot. And she got all this stuff on, Velcro, and it's connected. And she can take it off because she washes, and, but she puts it back on. She's got to wear this. She's not supposed to leave it off. She just takes it off to clean up and I guess give her flesh a little air. I don't know. But she's supposed to wear this thing for 12 weeks. And they're hoping that things work out and they don't have to do more surgery. And they're just hoping that in 12 weeks this thing sets and seals and heals. And she's had it on for one week. She's supposed to wear it for 11 more and she's got 11 breaks. These ladies come over in the service, we're teaching, and they just, Jesus, you girls are awesome. They're just, Jesus. And she goes... God's mending my bones. I don't know what they're saying, but they can tell. God's mending my bones. And I'm like, I see you're taking all this stuff off. And I'm like, ah! Oh! Because I thought it was some zealous prayer, folks. Well, if you're in faith, take it off. You need to walk. If you're healed, walk. Get it off. Take it off. Come on, we'll push you. You know, that's people get that way. Don't do that. Grace will tell you you're healed. Your body will move. It's not a physical therapy. It's not a push and shove. And I'm like, I ran over and I said, honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm healed. I said, okay. I said, so you're taking that off? She said, yeah. I said, are they asking you to take off? No. Sir, I'm healed. I said, okay. 
so what was she told me? And I was like, whoa. Because I'm overseeing this meeting. And I, I got an authority. And I'm not like, stop your meds. Take off your braces. <laughs> I know they said if you don't take that, you're going to die. But don't take it if you have faith. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I want their body to tell them. I want them. I don't have to get weird with that thing. Jesus isn't bothered by that. So I'm just trying to help. And I'm like, honey, so you want to take that off? And I said, can you just feel and, and move around and, and verify just with it on? That She said, sir, I'm taking it off. I felt him mend my bones. And she said, it's so convicting. I'm like, you know, I'm almost like, well, forgive me for my unbelief. Take the thing off. <laughs> See, it's not that I didn't believe. I just didn't want her moving in zeal and emotion. She took that thing off. 100% normal. Watch. Went to lunch with the pastors and them, and she came along. She was one of their administrators and assistants in the office. Wore a little pair of of brown, like, lace-like shoes with a half heel. The next afternoon came to lunch. Come walking in, little summer dress and a little half heel thing. And I'm like, 11 breaks. Jesus. See, what happens is we pray for something and it don't change, and then we start writing theology. We take it personal. We take it in the face. We take it as a slap. We take it into our identity, and then we start saying a lot of stuff to try to make us feel better about what we feel bad about, and that's not cool. Amen. So we're saying a lot of things that he never said. We're writing books when the book's already written. Let's just follow Jesus. He said, if you believe in me, the things I do, you'll do them too. They came and said, why couldn't we heal the epileptic boy? He said, because of your unbelief. That's different than you don't have no faith. What he's saying is because of what you're failing to see. All you're seeing is a seizure. All you're seeing is it not stopping. And all you're thinking about is how you feel and what's wrong and why isn't it changing. And you are not seeing who you are in light of me. You've gotten distracted. Happens to us all the time when it's a visual. When it's so quadriplegic and you're praying and them arms ain't changing, your mind is spinning if you'd even put yourself in that position. The truth is people say, well, i never seen blind eyes open. And I say, how many did you pray for? Because then a man rolls in and says, he's seen blind eyes open and it doesn't affect you because you weren't there. So now it's just his story, his testimony. You say, well, I've never seen anybody get out of a wheelchair. How many did you pray for? I've seen them get out of wheelchairs in the public, on strip malls, in the airport. Yeah. On the front of Walmart, on the porch of Bob Evans' restaurant. <laughs> Just fun. When you see their faces. And you see the daughter who's an unbeliever, and she's rolling her eyes in cynicism. And all of a sudden, her precious mother, who she loves, stands up without one problem. And the daughter goes, and just starts bawling. And you hold her and say, I understand that you didn't believe. It's okay, honey. You're not marked for that. Listen, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of stuff and a lot of pain, but it doesn't mean Jesus isn't real, sweetie. And I loved on her, I think, more than I did the mother. Because she was like, oh, brother, a religious fanatic. I'm trying to get mom to the car, and do we have to pray right in front of everybody, right on the porch? <laughs> That's how she was feeling. Amen. And I looked up and smiled, and I said, honey, I know what you're feeling and thinking right now, but it's okay. You got nothing to lose. I said, Jesus loves your mother, and I just want to pray, and she's totally okay with it, so please be okay with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. And every trace of what was in her changed on the porch of Bob Evans. And her daughter standing there innocently filled with unbelief. Not evilly, innocently. She just doesn't know any better. So she's boasting in her unbelief. It didn't seem to intimidate Holy Spirit. Why? Because you have to make sure it doesn't intimidate you. Because you carry him and release him. 
So Jesus said, because of your unbelief. What he's saying is because of what you fail to see. Let's forget Ephesians 4 for now. Let's just forget it. You can read it on your own time. It, it's, <laughs> Ephesians 4 is the first session today. Bam, I preached it out. You read it, it'll speak to you. It talks about you no longer walking in darkness as if you don't get it now that you've been taught, now that you see. Don't be like the Gentiles. You haven't been taught Christ this way. You go on and you live for Him. Amen? And you put off the things of old. And you put on the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what I'm saying? That's Ephesians 4. You can read it. See, Ephesians 4 pumps me up. Now I want to read it. But you stay, no, you stay in Matthew 17. And I'm coming right there. But listen to this. Therefore, because all this is true, it says that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. I'm reading Ephesians 4, the end of it. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to preach it. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Well, i got to preach that. What that means is don't be angry at the cost of the value of another. You can be passionate about topics, but don't let it cost the identity of men in your eyes. Anger with sin has to do with your anger directed towards flesh and blood where you lose sight of somebody's value, purpose, and potential where you see them for what they failed in instead of see them for what they're called to. You guys with me? Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, and let him have something to give to those who have need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the one that's hearing. And... Do not grieve, Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Watch this. Let all, let all, not some, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, loud speaking, evil quarreling be put away from you. That's in a place of prayer. God, that's not who I am. That's not what I was created to be. When I lived for myself, those things were normal. I've died to myself and live unto you. They don't even make sense. Thank you. You've changed everything about my life. You truly are a firm foundation. Ah, you're getting it away, putting on him, putting off the old, putting on the new. It's all through prayer. It's all in relationship. Yay. It's not a New Year's resolution that you're risking failing. You're putting it away. You guys with me? Come on, I'm really teaching a lot today. You all getting this? Yes. And be, oh my goodness, be kind to one another. It's not weak. It's not wimpy, guys. Amen. Tender hearted. That ain't like, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm fine. Hey, dude. <laughs> Go. Be tender hearted. Be kind to one another. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love even as Christ also has loved us and gave himself for us a sweet offering and fragrance unto God, a smelling aroma. Yeah. <laughs> you be imitators of God and walk in love just as Jesus loved. Yeah. He's telling you it's possible. Yes, it is. Guess what love is? It's patient, it's kind, it doesn't seek its own, it takes no account, no account. Love takes no account of the wrong done to it. Not the accidents, the wrong. Not the mistakes, the wrong. Love takes no account of the wrong done to it because it doesn't seek its own. Let me ask you a question. Then why are we so busted up by one another? Because we've become Christians without realizing it for our sake instead of his name's sake. And we've become Christians for what he can do for us instead of how he can make us more like him. And we have need of healing and blessing and all this stuff. And we're going after that like it's some kind of Christian grab bag. Mm. And we're missing being transformed and made into his image. He said, forgive one another because he forgave you. He didn't say, try to get over it. <laughs> well, brother, I'm trying. Just give me time. Sometimes it takes time. Who taught you that? 
the world, not Jesus. That'd be like you coming for mercy and he says, look, I'm thinking about it. Look, you really threw me for a loop this time. Come on. If you can't find what you're thinking in the mouth of God and you put what you're thinking in his mouth and it sounds foolish, then it ought to be foolish in yours because you're made for his image. Come on, if he didn't talk, teach you to speak that way, why is it acceptable speech? Come on, I'm being straight and strong with you on this. Well, yeah, but brother, sometimes stop. Just stop. Why would you keep trying to hold on to what's called to die? Why make excuses and exceptions for your flesh? Why try to assure a language that makes yesterday tomorrow? Or tomorrow yesterday? That works both ways. Yesterday, tomorrow, tomorrow, yesterday. Yeah, it was the same. Whoa, that was good. Why? Walk in love as Christ loved. You guys in Matthew 17? Of course you are. It's, it's me you're worried about. Matthew 17, verse 14. You have to understand that in this chapter, he's just coming from the Mount of Transfiguration, okay? Are you guys... Good, because we just had lunch. Does anybody need to stretch quick and then we'll do this chapter and we'll close? You guys need a break? You need to go potty stuff and all that good stuff? You want to stretch? Does anybody need, are you falling asleep? Are you falling asleep, brother? I almost called your name a while ago. I just didn't hear it. If I'd have heard it, I'd have called it. I'm kidding you, I'm kidding you. Why don't you take a, just take a 10 minute break, man. Let's be back at 10 of and we'll wrap this up and we'll break for supper and then we'll come back for our evening service. Can you guys go stretch, go get some air? Just wake up, man. Just, yeah. Jesus' name. God, you're good. Jesus!